This week on CrossFeed. Hating the president. Staying faithful online. Take that shirt off in school. Don't impose your religion on me in school. Don't sing that religious song in school. Hello, everyone, and welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, Pastor S- uh, Shepherd, <laughs> Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio. He still doesn't know where he lives. <laughs> hey, I'm Pastor Jim Butler out here in Dedham, Massachusetts. I know where I'm at. I'm out here in Great New England, home of the Patriots. That we're looking for another Super Bowl season again this year. <laughs> so I'm really excited. I have health insurance. <laughs> We've been dealing with red tape since we got here for two months, and uh, you know it, it, it's all backdated and everything. Um, but uh, it, it's just been a huge headache. And I mean, you know, here at the church, they're doing everything they're supposed to do and everything. But you know, it's just like, oh, you didn't fill out the paperwork right and all this kind of stuff. And oh man, so but I got the phone call today with the numbers. And we have health insurance, so woo! <laughs> I was thinking I was gonna end up having to wait for the, you know, free one. <laughs> Freedom is the right of all sentient beings. Well, I'm glad uh, that you were able to get it. Glad that was all taken care of. I've lost my job, my apartment, my car, and my girlfriend. You still have your health. Oh, and I got a new shirt today. And if you can read it. You did. It says, this shirt is illegal. This shirt is illegal. In 52 countries. Restricted nations, 38. Hostile areas, 14. And then on the back. And in schools. Yeah. And in schools. Okay. okay. We'll come to that story in just a second. Go ahead. In the back. <laughs> it's got... Uh, you can, it, it's got a cross, and it says, uh, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation for all those who believe. So, and it's uh, it's from Voice of the Martyrs, which, if you're not familiar with it, persecution.org. Uh, they're, uh, they're sort of the Amnesty International of, uh, of persecuted Christians. So, um, it's a great organization. They've got just a ton of material. Uh, if you're Anybody out there, pastors, I know we've got a lot of pastors um, watching and listening to the show. They have materials if you want to do a, a Sunday on uh, awareness of the uh, persecuted church or, or things like that. They've got a lot of stuff available for that. Um, just a great organization, and so I don't mind promoting them on this show. And uh, they, they just do tremendous good work. So speaking of can't wear it and it's illegal, let's go to school. We've got three. This just sort of worked out randomly. We didn't have a lot of stories this week. And uh, so it was kind of ironic that we ended up with three stories about schools. It was completely unintentional. Um, But there are three states, in addition to the 52 countries, um, where the shirt's illegal, there are three states where it's still illegal, and that is Oregon, Pennsylvania, and Nebraska. In those three states, teachers are not allowed to wear any sort of religious clothing in their classrooms. So if you're a, a Sikh or a Muslim and you want to wear a, you know, like a turban or any kind of a headscarf or that kind of stuff because of your religion, you cannot Presumably, that means that if you're a Christian and you want to wear a cross necklace, you can't do that either. Although I haven't, you know, I would have think I'd have heard about that by now. Apparently, it's not enforced everywhere. Cuff them, boys. We're putting this dirt bag away. Uh, but if you're in Oregon and you happen to be a pastor, maybe you're a public school, a public school substitute teacher, you can't wear a clerical collar in, in the classroom. Uh, it, just, just so you know, folks, and, and people sitting there going, oh, the, you know, these bunch of liberals, you know, that kind of... This, this, I'm going to t- the state that the, this, this law was originally backed by the Ku Klux Klan. So, you know, 
So if you if you if you want to say, well, they shouldn't. You agree with the KKK folks? Uh, now, actually, then I guess I do too, because um, okay, now I, I can understand a, a Muslim wearing the headscarf. I mean, that's part of her. It's not really just religious garb; it's kind of everyday garb. Yeah, it's kind of a cultural thing because right. not all Muslims wear. Uh, but on the other hand, I mean, uh, to wear, you know, I, I uh, you know, I wouldn't want. Uh, I was in the mall the other day and uh, saw this person wearing a um, pentacle t-shirt with the pentacle, and you know, down below, blessed be, you know, so the person was Wiccan. Um, I really wouldn't want a teacher to wear that in my kid's classroom. We are fond of wait, why we burn out? Well, that's a little different, though. That's not a, a requirement, and it's not, and, the, you know, I don't know, isn't there some sort of uh, common sense thing as far as uh, kind of really obvious, um, kind of in your face? I mean, like, the shirt like I'm wearing, okay? No. All right, that would be, not because it's religious, but because it's a distraction, Okay. And, you know, teachers, you expect them to dress professionally. And, and so, um, you know, they should be wearing professional clothing, which would mean not, you know, printed T-shirts and, and, and stuff like that. But at the same time, if it's a, a religious thing where you consider, you know, this is something really important to me. Um, you know, maybe a, a Christian who really who wears a, a cross as a necklace or earrings or something like that. And so, you know, this is this is part of who I am. Um, and it's really important to me uh, to wear this as an expression of my faith. I, I think that as long as it's uh, um, as long as it's not something really sort of confrontational um, and just a sort of uh, subtle expression of faith, um, that there should be room for that. Are you a God-fearing man, Senator? Right. Um, you know, I, I kind of like what they said. Um, um, I hate to say I agree with the American Civil Liberties Union, but I do on the grounds that impartial children should not feel indoctrinated by their teachers. Yeah. But I don't know if that's really indoctrination. I think that's... Uh, I mean, because the cases here, the the recent cases, well, no, I mean, are I think it's, like it's, Muslims it's, with the headscarves and stuff. Freedom is the right of all sentient beings. Right. I would say, no, I actually, you know, now I, I think they're wrong in saying that that's indoctrination, okay? I don't have a problem with the Muslim wearing their headscarf. I see it in the post office all the time. I just say hi and just, you know, how you doing? That's all I do. You know, I don't put any, go any further than that. Um, you know, but I can see a shirt like the one you're wearing or or, or my the shirt saying blessed be. I can see that being considered a indoctrination. I can't see having a cross around your neck being indoctrination because I know a lot of people who wear those who aren't particularly religious. True. You know, yeah. so... For the, the, you go to the fair and, you know, the WWJD bracelets that are hanging right next to the pot leaf necklaces, you know? <laughs> you got some interesting fairs. <laughs> um, oh, that was back in Wisconsin. <laughs> Okay, like I said, interesting fairs. That would make perfect sense to me. <laughs> Maybe that, well, would Jesus smoke anyway? Uh, um, Who can? So it's interesting. Uh, uh, um, one woman um, said, however, that she uh, never ran into a conflict of style on covering her hair. Um, and one Muslim teacher, she says, um, you know, uh, here's somebody of a different background who can bring diversity to staff that they saw as a positive thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would probably see it as a positive thing, too. Good on you, mate! Yeah, I, you know, I just, I, I think it really comes down to how you do it. If you're if you're an in-your-face kind of person um, or, or you're wearing something that's going to detract from teaching, that's going to take the focus off of your job as a teacher... Then even in a Christian school, you don't want to do that because, you know, your job is to teach, all right? Now, if, I suppose if you're, um, you know, if you're the pastor and you're wearing your collar in a, you know, in a Christian school, well, that would be appropriate, I suppose. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm 
one of the things they mentioned in this article is they said that um, those who, the parents that had the strongest religious beliefs um, were the ones that really wanted the religious neutrality. So they said, you know, it's the, the, the religious people are the ones that are pushing for, you know, for this law. And I understand the neutrality thing, but uh, there's a, the leader of the Sikh American Legal Defense and Education Fund and the spokesman for the Council on American Islamic Relations uh, said that, you know, the enforcement now tends to fall on minorities. You know, oh, oh, the headscarf. Yeah, that's got to go. OK, but nobody's complaining about someone wearing a cross necklace. You know, okay, well, what if somebody's wearing a pentacle necklace or a crescent, you know, or or something like that? Um, Yeah, I I imagine nobody would care about a crescent, you know. Um, I find it interesting. A lot of it started off as anti-Catholic. Yeah. uh, uh, Stuff and... uh, Just keep the uh, priests and nuns out. Yeah, keep the, you know, keep the nuns that they couldn't wear their their clothes that identify them as priests and nuns and things like that. Um, but, you know, I just, I find a lot of it uh, very odd myself. Um, but, you know, again, I think it's what's disruptive. I My, my son went to a, a Christian high school, and um, well, even my first church uh, when we, uh, uh, and they had, you know, rules against anything on the front of the shirt. You know, they just wanted plain shirts, period, because they didn't want anything that was just disruptive, and my, my first church, I just thought it was the stupidest thing I ever heard of. Um, and so I wanted to buy every, all the kids in eighth grade T-shirts saying Jesus is my Savior and see what the school board did. You know, they went up and make them, they make them take them off or what. And the principal walks into me and goes, Jim, please don't do that. <laughs> you know, uh, a little bit of rebellion on my part, but, um, but the problem was the year before is these kids were walking in shirts that were really distractive. And so, you know, next year we, we, we balanced, we worked with them to balance it out, but it was just one more thing they didn't want. It was, it was easier, you know, to sit there and say, you know, as I was talking to my son, because he was gotten mad at his eyes, I said, it's easier to say nothing on the shirt at all than to say that's offensive or that's disruptive. Why? And get into an argument. Right. No, that's true. But so, I don't know. I think it's lazy, too. You know, you going for the easy. Easy isn't always best. So, I don't know. And you I, have never stood in a classroom with 25 kids and have to deal with that. Nope. No, I haven't. I uh, okay. have never had in a classroom you know with 15. <laughs> Just shut up. Because until you've done it, don't, tell, don't talk to somebody. I did it for three years. I taught uh, <laughs> religion in grades. Three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, five days a week. Yeah, okay. And believe me, you do not want to have to go in there and enforce trust code stuff. And to have some kid go, wearing something that's, you know, distracted or, you know, I don't think it's just distracted. Just, just, and then they argue with the parents about it. Just much easier to say, nothing on there. Uh, it's easy to enforce, believe me. Because yeah. you want to be teach the kids. You don't want to be able to deal with this. But this on parents, uh, on the teachers, I think, um, you know, again, so long as it's, it doesn't uh, indoctrinate in any way, um, you know, or uh, or anything like that, I would see it more as a sign of diversity. So let's, let's stay in school here. Where's, where's our next school story here? So the next question is, what music is allowed? Yeah, let's go to that one. This was really, okay, we've talked about, um, uh, talking about Jesus or talking about your faith in commencement speeches. Uh, we, I think we talked about, uh, singing, uh, Christian songs in schools and, and stuff like that. All right. But this one is a little different. All right. This is a, uh, uh, this is a commencement. All right. And, um, but they were, they wanted to play, uh, Ave Maria, uh, not the Schubert one that most people are familiar with, but it's the, from Franz Bibel, uh, or Bible. I don't know how to pronounce it, sorry. Um, my German's rusty, yes. And yes, I'm Lutheran. Um, <laughs> but, uh, the, this is in Everett, Washington, and the superintendent, uh, wanted to, he vetoed, 
And this was the instrumental version, right? Are you the police? So, no, ma'am. Um, We're musicians. The, the court said that it wasn't necessarily forbidding religious music at graduation, unlike prayers, which the U.S. Supreme Court has barred at high school commandment, commencements as an unconstitutional endorsement of religion. The appeals court said it was reasonable for school officials concerned about an appearance of religious favoritism to prohibit the playing of an obviously religious piece. Now, here's my question. If it's instrumental, all right, and it's not the Schubert one that everybody knows, all right, um, and frankly, even if it weren't instrumental, it's in Latin, would anybody know? I mean, is this really obviously religious? All right. Okay. This is, this is, I hate to even tell this story, but it is true. My last congregation, we had a very professional uh, musician. She, she was a professional pianist as our organist. She was Episcopalian. Her boyfriend was um, later fiance, later husband was from Poland, and he was um, a violinist, professional violinist. They they played these duets that were just wonderful. What I'd really like to do is put the greatness of um, this man in perspective. So, um, <clears throat> when they were just at one Sunday without without you know okaying with me first in the middle <laughs> during communion, they're playing Ave Maria. Okay, I'm too dumb to even realize what it is. Okay, it, you know I go back to about the 1950s, listening to Dion and the Belmonts. Okay, maybe Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons here. Okay, so this is a little outside my my normal range here of music. I have no idea what it is, and oh, I had people come up to me afterwards, just hitting, just, just you know, I you know, for good reason, hitting, hitting, hitting the ceiling, you know. But, I didn't recognize what it was. Uh, so my question is then is, you know, given a bunch of high school students and the depth of their, you know, culture to, to where, you know, Cindy Lauper is, uh, 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 you know, old time music, how many of them would really be in to recognize this? <laughs> yeah. See, you know, and honestly, I, I have to confess that Ave Maria, I was first introduced to that, to, I mean, to, to Schubert's version. In Fantasia, <laughs> okay. So, um, I I had I the story had a, a YouTube video, and I was trying to get the audio so that everybody else could hear it because you wouldn't recognize it either. Uh, all I could find was choral versions on YouTube, and I was having problems pulling the audio off of it. Um, but if you go and and you you just uh, Google it or or go to YouTube and and look it up, there's a whole bunch of different choirs singing it, and um. It wasn't familiar to me at all. And, you know, and I do enjoy classical music from time to time, um, especially when I'm writing sermons, relaxing and um, not distracting. But it's, yeah, I I could see if, you know, we, we talked about there was one where they wanted to do this country song um, that was just, you know, really just sort of obnoxiously Christian. Um, or, or not even Christian, just sort of, um, pop God or something like that, you know? Um, and, uh, but this is, this is so obscure that I, I'm sorry. I have to, I have to disagree with this ban. This is, you know, and I suppose if you're gonna, you know, going back to that whole discussion of, uh, well, you know, we're just gonna do a blanket ban. I don't know. You know, the um, there was a judge that dissented. He wrote that religious music is the foundation of Western classical music; that it expresses secular artistic messages. Upholding the ban, he said, would hasten the retrogression of our youth into a nation of Philistines who have little or no understanding of our civic and cultural heritage. <laughs> and so, you know. I, <laughs> I mean, he's exactly right. You know, you get to listen to Mozart, you know, Beethoven, Bach. You go right down the line, and half of the stuff that these guys wrote 
was religious in some way. It's how they made their living, you know, as as court composers. And, um, well, okay, Bach was a church organist, but, dude, that's noisy. Sorry. Um, I have to forgive the, the, the audio quality is not quite uh, what it normally My is. son <laughs> has lost my headphones, so that's, I don't know where they are. This is what you get when you get 18-year-olds. <laughs> their brains seep out of their heads. <laughs> so, so anyway, we apologize for the quality. Just wait, Dale. You will find out. Yeah, I don't have sons. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, you have daughters. So anyway, they get boyfriends. It's worse. Then, then, then you learn to use the shotgun. Anyway, uh, back to this. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, if you ever listen to half of what high school students listen to, they are cultural Philistines. Uh, <laughs> And I'm sorry, but Akon and, uh, you know, half the other rap is, it's all it's worthless stuff. And they, you know, eat it up like crazy. But that's, that's, that's going in, you know, that's another story. But, um, yeah, I, this was upheld by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which, of course, as I've mentioned before, has the distinction of being the most overruled Court of Appeals by the Supreme Court, um, often unanimously. And I think if the you know they wanted to push this one and the Supreme Court chose to hear it, they would overrule this one too, uh, because um, the Supreme Court has settled that uh, uh, religious music of a cultural nature uh, can definitely be done within a public school setting. Yeah. So let's so, stay in okay. school and uh, yep. go back to teachers and. Um, that is this question of imposing religion um, versus teaching about religion, all right? Um, and this is uh, some excerpts from the On Faith uh, section. Washington Post and Newsweek have a um, sort of joint uh, discussion <laughs> on religion. And so these are some excerpts. On, and here's the, the question. The Texas Board of Education, the nation's second largest purchaser of public school textbooks, is revising its K-12 social studies curriculum and deciding how to characterize religion's influence on American history. So they have uh, three, three consultants have recommended emphasizing the roles of the Bible, Christianity, and, civic, and the civic virtue of religion. Right? So the question is, basically, to put it another way, how should... Secular or uh, public schools, social studies classes, talk about religion, all right? And in some textbooks, just completely ignore it. It's as if it didn't happen or it, as if there's no such thing, which is sort of ridiculous um, because so much of history revolves around religion or or they'll talk about, you know, sort of the Greek myths and stuff like that, but they won't talk about, um, you know, Christianity and, or, or, um, a lot of times they'll talk about, uh, more, more focus on sort of, uh, Muslims and, and, and stuff like that just because they figure, well, people know about Christianity. We're going to, you know, tell them the stuff that they don't know. So, um, or, you know, do you want to talk about, oh, yeah, the, the Christian church did this and that, and because of, of uh, various religions, you know. So what do you do? How, you know, where do, how do you go on this? We are the future, Charles, not them. They no longer matter. And well, I'd like to know exactly what, you know, a little bit more what these consultants say, because it's interesting enough that the, 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 the four people who respond here seem to be in completely, uh, uh, almost on different planets. Uh, you know, this first guy uh, is exec Robert Parnum, executive Durastic Baptist Center for Ethics, must be a Northern American Baptist, you know, uh, uh, you know, accuses them of being bent on a Texas theocracy. Uh, you know, uh, the religious right wants to impose its religion on public schools. That's that's his opinion and the story. Uh which absolutely no thoughtful thoughtfulness there, I thought at all. Um, 
jump uh, the seconds. Yeah, the second guy says, you know, just simply it's it's a matter of historical accuracy. Um, you know, you cannot understand uh, the pilgrims coming to America unless you understand their religious understandings. Right, right. You know, it's it's that whole thing. Ask a, a kid, speaking of Philistines, um, ask them, what does the word pilgrim mean? All right. When I was growing up, I had no idea. Pilgrims were people that had funny belt buckles on their hats. All right. That's all it meant to me. And it wasn't mm-hmm. until high school or later, I mean, that I understood, oh, a pilgrim. Oh, that's someone who is, you know, going somewhere for a religious purpose. Um, and uh, I, had, you know, I but, had no idea. I mean, even there, it's just understanding they came to America seeking freedom. What kind of freedom? Religious freedom. To be able to worship God as they saw fit. Um, you know, the first Thanksgiving was not a, you know, not an opportunity for them to invite the, the Indians over to have dinner. It was an opportunity to thank God for what he had done for them and, you know, their, their survival. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you just, Providence, the city of Providence, Rhode Island was founded because of, you know, Hey, Baptist Rob Parnum, he was founded because of you guys. He wanted to be a, Roger Williams was a Baptist. He wanted to be able to worship God his own way. They wouldn't let him do it in Boston. So he went and founded a new city. Um, uh, you know, if you don't understand the first and second great awakening, you're not going to understand a huge part of, 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 of American history. I mean, it's just, um, it's a reality. Of the four articles here, Actually, I thought the best one I thought was this rabbi from the National Jewish Center for Learning and Leadership. Mm-hmm. Um, and he says, um, uh, in the Texas case, it seems the fiercest ideologues are all on the side of turning our school, public schools into Christian academies. Well, then he goes on and he says this, religion has animated many causes in our nation's history. And our children are entitled to hear the entire story in all its complexity. This is what it means to study the history of religion and its influence in America, which we should do, and not teach either theology or devotional religion in our public schools. I think he's right on it. I, like I said, I'd like to know what these consultants actually said. Yeah, um, yeah, and of so course that, you don't get that. No, we don't get that. I mean, I think what he says there makes perfect sense to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not. It's not like it's promoting a particular religion. It's not teaching theology. It's talking about the impact of groups of people, and possibly the you know their teachings, and and what the impact was on that. Um, my my daughter in her uh, world history class right now is studying the Renaissance and therefore the Reformation, but she was kind of frustrated because they just sort of glossed over, you know. Um, most of the details of it and, and didn't really get into, they talked about the Reformation, but it was this sort of, sort of cursory approach that you really didn't get anything out of it. Well, mm-hmm. you know, she studied the Reformation confirmation <laughs> class. So now, you know, interestingly enough, when I, um, when my daughter had world history, uh, I offered the teacher to come in and talk about Luther. And, um, Learn to know the dark side of the force. And at the, I think he, he forgot about it, actually. But at the beginning, he said, that I think it would be great to have you come in and do that. You know, and, uh, you know, he said that would be, you know, very appropriate to have you come and talk about, you know, who Luther was and what he did and, and why, you know, uh, uh, what he did was important um, and, and, and how that all worked. Um, I mean, that's all part of our, you know, understanding of, of, of world history. You know, what's going on in, you know, and you can't understand so much of what happened in European history without understanding religion, both good and bad. Mm-hmm. I mean, the Thirty Years' War is not a good thing. Nope. But it was a battle over religion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, you know, there's just so much... It, it's what happens when you throw the baby out with the bathwater, all right? Getting back to the whole question of 
are you going to, um, you know, you're just going to scrap the whole thing to avoid, um, controversy or, you know, you can't. And, you know, it comes down to picking your battles. Okay. And, uh, and where, which ones you, you have to allow for, you know, certain, uh, content and, and which ones you don't. But, you know, I mean, honestly, while you can, you know, you can argue about, uh, you know, Christian t-shirts or something, um, you know, when it comes to the role of, if you, if you scrap, um, if, if you scrap, uh, religion out of history, um, you know, it's, <laughs> it's sort of like certain movies where you, oh yeah, they're doing a TV edit of that movie and you go, well, that's going to be a pretty short movie. You know, <laughs> I guess you watch those kind of movies. I don't really do. But anyway, um, so I'm glad you know that. Um, but what, what, what I was confused reading about this is then, then the last guy here, uh, Jay Brent Walker, who is the executive director of the Baptist Joint Committee. I don't know how he defines the, from the, the first Baptist here. This kind of goes to show you three Baptists, four opinions. Anyway, he... Um, concentrate, Pinky, concentrate. Uh-huh. He, he mentions that there was a, a statement about 15 years ago on teaching religion um, put out by the Department of Education and the Clinton administration and the Bush administration embraced it. And as I recall, that was a very, you know, neutral, very positive statement that I thought, you know, hun- handled the job well. So, again, I'd like to see exactly what uh, – because two of the people here say that, you know, um, you know, that, 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 that the um, – that there's a, a lot of agenda in what these consultants in Texas are saying. So I would like to see what those guys actually had to say. Yep. All right. Uh, we need to finish up here. Oh, speak um, these guys with agendas. Let's go down to Tempe, Arizona. This guy, you know, we, we talked a, a couple episodes about um, the whole Fred Phelps and the you know, Westboro Baptists and all that kind of stuff and, you know, what absolute fruitcakes they are. And, um, <laughs> and along comes a guy that <laughs> throws down the gauntlet and <laughs> tries to beat them at their own game by right. going even more ridiculous. <laughs> Pastor Steve Anderson doesn't give the name of his church. No, no, it's in here. Is it? It's, okay, uh, my, 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 my faithful my word Baptist church in Tempe. Okay. Well, at least the guy's not Lutheran. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, thankful, thankful for that. Anyhow, he has a, um, he delivered a sermon titled, Are You Ready for This, Folks? Why I Hate Barack Obama. Now, what in the world you would ever come up with a sermon t- title like that for? I have no idea. Um, and then he, Tell the people, quote, I hope that God strikes Barack Obama with brain cancer so he can die like Ted Kennedy, and I hope it happens today. He called this message spiritual warfare. Are you totally deranged? He said he does not condone killing. Um, but uh, there... Was a man carrying an assault rifle outside the Phoenix Arena where Obama spoke, um, which was around the same time, and uh, he was a member of Anderson's church. Hmm. Yeah. Um, well, he also he said, you know, he prayed that uh, he wants the president to melt like a snail with salt on it, and then he said, "I'm going to pray that he dies and goes to hell when I go to bed tonight. That's what I'm going to pray." Now, find a happy place, find a happy place, find a happy place. Correct me if I'm wrong here, because maybe I'm a little silly. But isn't there this thing about Romans 13 about be obedient to the authorities because God has established them? And isn't there is this, you know, this passage in, uh, I think it's First Peter, you know, pay taxes, give honor. This is madness. You know, yeah. this is, this is not... Uh, I mean, that there's there's what we Lutherans call the fourth commandment uh, about obeying your parents. And and we say, you know, there's also then the fathers of the country that we are obedient to our government and, and, and those authorities. Um, and even if it is a person that we believe is non-Christian, 
Shouldn't we be praying for that person's salvation? I mean, politically, I disagree with our president. Somebody asked me, one of the kids at the, the, my church asked me if I liked him. I said, I've never met him. I couldn't tell you if I like him or not. I disagree with where he stands politically. But I pray for him. Matter of fact, I was doing a service today at a nursing home, and I prayed for our president. I prayed for our Congress. Um, I prayed for the Senate. I mean, Paul prayed for the very emperor who later would persecute him and behead him. Yeah, 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 yeah. He, he, he wrote, he wrote, when he wrote Romans, Romans, he wrote it, wrote it, uh, uh, if I remember right, from prison, prison, where he was in prison, prison, prison. Not Romans, Romans he wrote on, no, that was, okay. Well, Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, and uh, Philemon he wrote for prison. Right. fine. So, regardless, though, I mean, this was a guy who was, who was persecuted for the faith. This is a guy who wrote to other Christians who were being persecuted, right? And he was saying, you need to honor the, those in authority over you. But, you know, even setting that aside, as if you could set aside parts of the Bible, all right? Even just looking at this strictly from a human being standpoint, all right? Like Jim said, we should be praying for his salvation, all right. If you believe that he's not a Christian, I have no reason to think that that he's not a Christian. He says he is, and while I disagree with some of his positions, not only politically but um, morally, um, you know, I, I I think that he's really trying to um, to do the right thing. I I just don't think that he is uh, on a lot of things. Although I I read a speech that he did for the um, the kids in school, and I thought it was pretty good. Um, uh, although I was annoyed that he ran long and cut short America's Got Talent, but <laughs> but uh, to to pray that someone goes to hell, I'm sorry, but that is just plain wrong. I mean, it's bad enough to pray that God would strike someone with brain cancer. All right, I can okay with that one. Now we talked about this when we talked about uh, that abortion doctor that was killed uh, a few weeks ago. All right. That, okay, I can understand the mentality that says it's a lesser of two evils, that maybe someone else could could replace him. The problem is, if Barack Obama died, then Joe Biden would go in there and, um, you know, and he holds the same position. And if um, and if, if something would happen to him, then Nancy Pelosi would be president, and she has the same position. So. God help us then. Yeah. Uh, but anyway. <laughs> All right, but you never ever pray for someone to go to hell. God no. wants all men to be saved. And all women, too. <laughs> no. So, uh, uh, but, yeah, that, that, that is, you know, God's will that all people will be saved. Um, this, this is not spiritual warfare. He's, he says he's striking against uh, Obama's abortion rights stance. So I'm sure this is going to get people on the other side to really be, you know, consider your words carefully. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, my second thing is, like, <sighs> what kind of gospel are you preaching? Mm -hmm. You know, it's a gospel saying if we get the right person elected. You're going to the mental institution. You know, then we'll be okay as a country. Hey. Pastor Steve, have you ever read Ephesians 5, 6, where Paul says our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual dark powers? If you're really wanting to get into spiritual warfare, you don't fight the people. You know, go after the one behind it. I just preached on that. And in fact, I talked about how, you know, we tend to, uh, you can go look up my sermon, um, and uh, it's... It's online. Uh, if you go to uh, shepherdoftheridge.org, I've got a little player up there so you can listen to it. And uh, I talked about who are the real enemies. That, um, you know, sometimes we think that the people uh, who are, you know, the uh, sometimes we think other Christians are, are enemies. They're not. All right? Sometimes we think that atheists or, or other non-Christians are enemies. They're not. These are people that Jesus died for. All right? If you think they're your enemies, then you don't understand the gospel. Right? Our enemy is the devil. 
All right. He's the one that wants us to go to hell. All right. The devil wants Barack Obama to go to hell. All right. So if he is praying for Barack Obama to go to hell, then he's praying to the devil. Well, he, I, he he's praying to God, but he's praying a prayer that God is not going to hear or answer. And, uh, you know, he needs to be, learn some, go learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Right. So, okay, so I, I would encourage all of our listeners and viewers to just pause this right now and say a prayer for Pastor Anderson. That he, that God reveal his truth to him. And, and also pray for the members of his congregation. And while you're at it, say a prayer for the president. He needs all the help he can get. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way. He's got a tough job that I wouldn't want. Right. Well, it's, it's always a, um, you know, yeah, it is a tough job because you know what, no matter what you say or what you do, you're going to <laughs> kick a lot of people off and you're going and to And someone's criticized. always trying to kill you. And that doesn't help either. Um, so let's end on a positive note. This last one is, I think, I think this last one's really quite positive. Mm-hmm. Uh, of all the stories, I think, you know, sometimes we can get some real negative stories. And um, this one is, is really kind of neat. Uh, um, and it's uh, 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 um, basically... Christian couples wanting to stay faithful online. You know, sometimes I've known um, couples that get involved in cyber affairs. Mm-hmm. Um, or just not even necessarily affairs, but get, you know, overly close in online friendships and, you know, become getting things that are, are kind of inappropriate sometimes. And, you know, it's just simply, the, and this was, was one guy, his name was Lance, he was out of work, and he was bored and lonely, and, you know, started getting, you know, the, meeting women online and, and stuff, and there was no affair, only chatting and, and doing stuff on email, and um, so now his wife um, and he just shared one email account, and... Uh, then, you know, they're able to, she's able to check on what he's saying. He's able to check on what she's saying. Um, you know, Bob, email. You know, uh, uh, and keeping into like, uh, you know, uh, email addresses like Jim Shauna or Christy and Brian, which kind of says, okay, we're, we are couples and we're, we have a commitment to one another. Aren't you wired? Online? Surfing the web? HTML, good buddy. So uh, this is just, you know, this is a great idea and something that, you know, just the whole uh, Internet thing, whether it be, um, now this this doesn't really get into the, you know, sort of Internet porn and all that kind of stuff, um, to some degree, but not really. But really, they're just focusing on this one thing of sharing an email address uh, with a couple. Now, my wife and I, it, we we have an address that if people want to send something to both of us, they can do that. And it, it's set up so that it will go to both of us. But we have separate computers. And um, and actually, we email each other back and forth a lot um, to uh, to exchange information. Or, um, But, you know, so then what do you do? What, do, what are some things that you can do um, to make sure that you have this sort of accountability? Um, because that's what the problem that a lot of people run into is that um, th- they can do all this stuff in private, and when the temptation comes, it's that sense of, I won't get caught, mm-hmm. right? So, you know, and for us, my wife knows my passwords, right? If she wants to, in fact, I've logged in, um, we use Gmail as our email server um, for all, I've got, you know, a few different accounts, but... I've logged in on her computer um, with those accounts and saved it in her little do you want to remember this password thing? So if she wants to go log into my account, she can at any time. All right. If she wants to check and see what I've been doing, um, who I've been talking to, what I've been talking about, she can do that. And, and in fact, honestly, um, that is true of 
um, even my work email. Now, she doesn't because she knows that um, that as a pastor I talk about confidential things, all right? And so she's got that as a fail-safe, but, she, you know, um, that's also so that if, you know, if something would happen to me and she was trying to figure out where I was or, or what happened or, or if just there was some information needed and, um, and I would be incapacitated in some way, she would still be able to access that. Um, but, you know, she, she knows that um, she's not going to go and, and check stuff out, um, you know, go reading, you know, private stuff. Um, and, but, you know, I know that she can access that stuff. I mean, and I know that she can access my personal emails. Um, I know that, that she can get onto my computer, uh, through file sharing and, and check the, the contents of my computer and stuff. And so, you know, we've got that accountability there so that we know what's going on with each other that we could check up on each other at any time. And it's not that, you know, and one of the things they talked about here in this article is that it's not that, not necessarily that you set it up that way to, you know, so that you can check up on each other. It's just like, oh, well, that's what we do. You know, it's sort of like we share a checkbook, right? Not because we want to, you know, keep an eye on what the other person's spending. In fact, it's kind of annoying when you're, trying to buy a, a birthday present or something like that. <laughs> it's like, how do I do this, you know, without, especially if you're buying something online and, and, uh, like our Amazon account, the, the receipts, I think goes to both addresses. So <laughs> like, uh, how do I buy something without her knowing about it? You know? And, uh, so that can get kind of tricky sometimes, but, uh, you know, the, the point is that it's, um, you just you set it up because we share a lot of stuff. I'm gonna marry that man. Right. Um, I mean, I, I think this is a real positive thing for couples. You know. Now, um, yeah, there's a woman pastor on there that she can't share one. There's congregants, and you know, personally, I would never put anything in an email. That would be in any or have anybody email anything to me that would deal with anything that they would want to keep confidential. I have a real basic rule about email. Don't ever put anything in an email that you don't want to see sent around the world. You know, that's the, you know, that's just the basic rule I have. Uh, because there's, once it's there, there's no, I, I, I at one time actually put something in an email that was really stupid. And it got sent out, and I, you know, forwarded from people, and I felt like an idiot afterwards. I just felt really bad about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I was in a real bad, I was in just a real bad mood, and it came through, and you hit that. Anyway, um, so I think this is a, a real positive, and I have known couples, um, people who've gotten involved in some not good relationships. Um, you know, it, online, you know, and, and part of it was they didn't have the other person, uh, their spouse to, to kind of depend on to kind of keep their eye on what's going on. Um, it's, it's not, it's not hard to do because, you know, what happens is they start, you know, getting involved somehow. And if it's strictly online and this is some person that you, you know, maybe be halfway across the country or whatever, uh, guess what? You you can kind of fill in the gaps and make that person your perfect person. Yeah, because you're only seeing it's you know you know like when you when you're dating and you sort of put on this this mask that you you show like all your best qualities because you're really trying hard to impress the other person. Well, think about how easy that is to do online, where you can you know stop and think about what you say before you say it, and you know and and really. Um, you just you only see a little snippet of that person as that person portrays themselves, which you know, and then you hear stories about people finding out that that girl's really a guy, and you know, and all this kind of stuff, and um, is is nothing like the persona that they put on, you know, um, and uh, as you know, the, the, as the old cartoon used to say, the nice thing about the internet is no one knows you're a dog. <laughs> 
Um, there's a great, uh, they're talking about the guy that runs the, uh, blog called Stuff Christians Like. His name is Jonathan, uh, a cuff. And, um, A-C-U-F-F. Not sure how to pronounce that. Um, but, uh, he said on the blog that he and his wife cleaved our separate email addresses and lit a unity candle on Yahoo that burns brightly throughout the virtual landscape. We offset the whole thing by not dressing alike. <laughs> I thought that was great. I have to check out his blog. It sounds pretty cool. Yep. So, um, you know, this, so this is just something to think about. Maybe something to discuss with your spouse is, uh, you know, how do I, what, what do I do to, um, to be transparent, um, to have that accountability? Um, you know, and the other thing is, is, um, uh, defending and protecting your marriage from the outside. And this is something I always talk with couples about, um, when I do premarital counseling. And, and that's the idea of, um, of sending a message to the world. I am not looking for someone else. I am happily married. Right. And so the things that I do, um, as a pastor, because pastors, you know, can become sort of targets that, you know, you're, you're a good listener and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And especially you've got a woman who's going through a divorce or something like that. And, and, oh, here's this guy. My husband doesn't listen to me, but boy, pastor listens to me and, and, you know, and stuff like that. And, um, and can look appealing. And, you know, they always tell us at the seminary, she doesn't like you. She likes your office. Um, and, uh, and those relationships not only being, you know, horribly sinful are, um, are doomed to failure. But, uh, you know, I, I do a lot of things, um, in, I, uh, if, if I mention my wife, um, in, in a sermon, it's always in a positive way that I talk about how much I love her and, and how important she is to me and, um, uh, how much I value her and, um, and how great of a marriage I have. And, um, and she, when I shake hands with people after church, uh, I, she stands next to me, she walks out with me and, um, and, and shakes hands along with me just to convey that message that we are, we are one flesh, we are one body. Um, she, something we started doing here, uh, that I hadn't done previously, but I'm really, um, happy that we're doing is when I take communion, um, I give communion to the, uh, the, uh, assisting elders and that. And then when they give me communion, my family comes up and takes it with me. And, um, which again is a way of, of conveying, uh, to the congregation. We're, we're a happy family. Don't do anything to mess that up. Don't think that I'm going to be interested in, you know, in changing that. Um, I get to come home since I work next door. Um, not even next door. My office is in the garage. Um, I come home for lunch every day. I get to eat lunch with my wife and, um, and I love that. And, um, and so, and, and for that matter, I've got windows on my office, right? I leave, I leave the curtains open, um, and you know, the blinds open and stuff so that if my wife is out in the yard, she can see into my office and see that I'm not doing anything inappropriate with anybody, you know? Um, and I especially, even if, you know, if the, if the sun's shining in weird or something like that, uh, which it does in the morning, I, I shut that curtain, but no one can really see in that window anyway. Um, but if, you know, if for some reason, um, I would have them shut because of the sun shining in, um, if I'm in there with someone alone, um, it comes open whether it's obnoxious or not. One ring to rule them all. So, you know, think about what you can do to protect your marriage, to send that message um, that don't mess with my marriage because it's not going to happen. Right. You know, I'll tell you something that would really help out, I think, life. That's if we got no more comments about Kenny and stuff. <laughs> You know, I got all those good little comments there on YouTube. You guys are a couple of idiots. Well, thank you. Um, that was so, so insightful. That's right up there with uh, Pastor Anderson and Barack Obama. 
hopefully maybe you would have some more uh, what would be a good thing? Uh, interesting comments to send us. Uh, we would really appreciate that at podcast at crossfeednews.com. Yep. And, uh, or if you, uh, if you want to pop over to iTunes, go to the iTunes store, type in, uh, crossfeed religious news or just even religious news, we pop up kind of toward the top and, um, and go to our, um, go to the listings there and leave a review. Uh, I, I just looked, and it's been um, a couple of years since we've had a review on the audio one. We've never had a review on the video one. And uh, so we would love it if you would do that. That would be very cool. Um, if, you, <laughs> if you're if you using iTunes, by the way, and you have an iPod, if you... Um, I, I ran into a bug with it, and I'm kind of annoyed and waiting for the update, that if you use podcasts in... Uh, if you group them into playlists, uh, smart playlists at least, um, <laughs> it, it gets messed up on your iPod. Um, so there's a warning if you haven't upgraded to iTunes 9 yet. But uh, but we do appreciate the feedback. And uh, yeah, podcast at crossfeednews.com. Uh, also, a reminder to go to crossfeednews.com and post stories and, um, you know, what do you find interesting? And, you know... The, Put some up there. If you're not sure how to do it, you know, uh, send us a note and, and we'll help you out. But it's pretty straightforward. Yeah. Correction. Send Gail a note. He will help you out. <laughs> For a while there, I was sending my stories. They were all going back to last November. They were going through a time warp or something. Yeah, so. there's a bug in the site. But um, that I even a lot of Drupal gurus can't figure out what's going on with it. But you know, it's it's really, um, it, I'll I'll see the stuff there and and fix it for you, so right. eventually. On that note, folks, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. God bless your week. Yep. Good night, everybody. God bless.